I'm Daniel Forkner, and this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Now, our favorite co-host, David Torsivia, is in Los Angeles for the week and will not be joining us today. And that's his loss, but our gain, because today we are happy to be joined in studio by Mariah King. Mariah is a native of Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, who just returned a few months ago from a two-year service in Peace Corps, China. Now she works for an NGO out of Washington, D.C., and we are fortunate to have her on to provide her perspective on some of the issues we're going to be discussing today. Mariah, welcome to Ashes, Ashes. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, we're really happy to have you, Mariah. And like I said, you served in Peace Corps China for two years, right? What did you do over there? I was a university English teacher, and I did some teacher training in small communities in northwestern China, um, in Gansu province, in Lanzhou City. Mm-hmm. That sounds really interesting. I think we have a section today that we're going to be talking about some things going on in China. And I can't wait to hear your perspective on that. But now you're back in the state. You work for an NGO. What do you do with this NGO? Yeah. So right now I'm working for an NGO out of Washington, D.C. And I do community programming, um, working with food security in the area, health and nutrition, providing healthy meals. And I work with local organizations to help them build out their membership databases. So data and all that stuff. Okay. Awesome. Well, if you have listened to Ashes, Ashes in the past, you know that on this show, we discuss the underlying structural and systemic flaws in our world, flaws that threaten to collapse our very way of life. And each week we go in depth on a specific system to determine some of the root causes and what we can or cannot do to fix them. And these range from the environmental, the social, economic, the political, the technological, and more. But we're going to do something a little bit different this week, partly because David is out of town, but also because our world is changing so fast. We thought this would be a good time to look back towards some of the episodes we've done in the past and provide some new updates. So Mariah, are you ready to get started? Yep, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. So on episode five, we discuss infrastructure in the United States. And on March 7th of this year, around 2.30 in the morning, A 48-inch water main busted under Buford Highway in the city of Atlanta, flooding the road and leaving up to 700,000 residents in DeKalb County, which is the eastern half of the city, without water. Many businesses were closed Wednesday and Thursday. Hospitals had to reschedule surgeries and redirect ambulances, and public schools and universities in the area closed their doors. The CDC, which is headquartered in Atlanta, shut down its campus for two days. The pipe was fixed Friday morning eventually, and the entire county was advised to boil all tap water until that evening. The repairs involved around 50 people working 24-7 for two and a half days. We were also fortunate that a neighboring county had some pipes in storage that we were able to buy from them, or else it might have taken a lot longer. Now, Mariah, you were in Atlanta the day this happened, right? Yeah, I was. And did it catch you off guard? It caught me completely off guard. I just remember waking up in the morning. I'm excited about going on with my daily routine and I go to turn on the water and there's no water. And I think, okay, maybe there was scheduled maintenance that I wasn't made aware of. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was totally surprised. Yeah, the same thing happened to me. I woke up, tried to take a shower, didn't work. So I went to work in a baseball cap because my hair looks terrible when I don't get to wash it. And then I ended up getting my shower in the next day. So Well, I just I waited for a little while. And then when my mom told me she works at Dunwoody Elementary School, when she called me and said that the school was being let out early because there also wasn't any water. That's when I knew there was probably a big issue. So it caught you off guard. But when you were living in China, did this type of thing ever happen? Oh, man, this happened all the time. So I lived in a very dry area and pretty much a desert. And so water outages were frequent and sometimes they were scheduled, and but oftentimes they were not. Wait, so why would, why would they be scheduled? Well, the local government often scheduled outages just to check on the pipes, make sure everything was OK. And the way I would find out was through a notice that was just put on my door. Hey, water will be out from this time to this time. So do what you have to do. 
So when the water did stop working, either because of some problem or because of this government scheduling it to do maintenance and repairs, did schools shut down? Oh, no. Schools never shut down. Like I said, I was a university teacher, so I would go in for my regular hours. And I know what a lot of people in my community, what they would do was store water in their washing machines or store water in their kitchen sinks. So lots of water storage ahead of time, or they would just go to the local grocery market and just buy a couple gallons of water. But I also started storing my water in my washing machine and I learned it from my Ai, my auntie that lived across the way. Uh And she told me, hey, you know, we all just store water, boil it up and you'll be okay. Well, that's really interesting. It seems like you were more prepared for the water to go out living in China where it happened more frequently than you were in the United States, right? And it's also interesting because it makes me wonder if maybe we have allowed ourselves to be a little bit spoiled here in the United States, right? I think it's possible that we kind of take it for granted that things are just always going to work. And for that reason, we don't adequately prepare for when they don't. I mean, I don't know anybody who stores water in washing machines. So are there any other ways you might have prepared for the water going out? Besides that, no. But I think one difference between my community in China and the community that I live in here in the States is that they would just deal with it. I think in America, we're so used to having all of these conveniences. We take for granted that we have access to water and electricity 24-7, and we don't realize that there may be some periods of time where we just won't have it and we'll just have to make do. My students had to pay to shower. That's another way that they saved and conserved water in China is that they would kind of sort of limit the usage of water. So my students would shower once or twice a week, whereas here in America, we showered one or two times a day. Okay, so definitely spoiled when it comes to showering. (laughs) Spoiled when it comes to just having access to water and electricity. And, you know, maybe it's not just that we're unprepared when these things happen. Maybe the fact that we do expect the water to be there 24-7, maybe that fact itself has exacerbated the risks for some of our infrastructure problems. Because we are not willing to tolerate any intentional interruptions to our services, there is no political will for shutting things down to carry out those necessary repairs. That is, until there simply is no other option. So we did mention in episode five how the chairman of D.C.'s Metro, their public rail system, stated in 2016 that $25 billion was needed for major repairs of the Metro and that if they did not shut it down for months at a time to carry out those repairs, the whole system wouldn't be functioning at all in less than a decade. Well, over two years later, now there are plans to make some of these repairs and it's not going to be easy on residents of D.C., In the summer and fall of this year, 2018, four stations will be shut down at some point to conduct repairs, including two that will be out of commission for 45 days. Well, you know, Daniel, this kind of reminds me of some of the ways they maintain transportation in China. I remember the first time that I traveled to China back in 2014 in Beijing. They were trying to do some maintenance on their system and they just shut the whole thing down. So again, I think Americans are really fortunate that it's just a couple of stations for 45 days. So I think this shutdown for 45 days will just encourage D.C. residents to think about alternative modes of transportation. And I think it could actually be a good thing. Well, it certainly will take care of hopefully some major repairs that they need to do and maybe delay some of the even greater repairs they'll have to do going forward. And speaking of trains, in February of this year, 116 people were taken to a hospital and two people died when an Amtrak train collided with a freight train. A switch was locked into the wrong position, which diverted the train to the wrong track. And at the same time, a signaling system was down, which could have set off warnings. And the train itself was lacking an automatic braking system. And when we talk about infrastructure maintenance, these are the things that we really mean. Whether it's a company or a politician, it's a lot easier to spend money on something like a flashy new rail car than the switches and the software programs that form the underlying structures put in place to keep these systems safe and operational. And all these infrastructure systems are related. If increased failings in our railways causes some logistics companies to shift transportation to other methods like inland waterways or trucks and highways, then that just puts additional stress on those systems as well. And these problems can compound. Man, there's so much that can be said about infrastructure in the United States. Yeah, well, it's certainly getting a lot of attention now that a lot of these liabilities are coming due. But we did an entire episode on just one aspect of the infrastructure problem in the United States, and that's the power grid. 
So let's talk about that for a second. In the Western United States, over 25% of all power outages result from weather events. And that number will only increase as we see more extreme weather patterns from climate change. But it's not just in the West that weather is a problem. Because right now, New England has been getting hit hard by a series of storms, resulting in prolonged and widespread power outages across several states. These storms, called nor'easters, form from low-pressure areas in the Atlantic just outside Massachusetts and North Carolina. Differences in atmospheric pressure caused by the North Atlantic Oscillation lock jet streams into place over the eastern seaboard and Greenland. And this mixing of warm Atlantic air with the cooler Arctic gets swept up and directed into the coast, bringing heavy rain and snow, causing blizzards, floods, and hurricane-like winds. Well, these storms have been going on from Virginia to Maine and just wreaking havoc, most notably to the electrical grid. On Friday, March 2nd, an intense storm bringing powerful winds slammed into New England and around 2 million people lost power. School systems as far south as Washington, D.C. were shut down, and the federal government shut its doors. Hundreds of flights were canceled, Amtrak stopped running its trains, And amid historic flooding, both Maryland and Virginia declared states of emergency, and the National Guard was called into Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. And power companies were trying to restore power, but the winds were so powerful that bucket trucks could not be deployed. By the time the storm left, 600,000 people were still without power. Mariah, you were in Washington, D.C. when this happened, right? Yeah, I was actually in town for a big conference and leadership event, Mm -hmm. and we had our biggest day. So we actually didn't cancel our event. But I remember waking up and calling my brother and asking him if he could pick me up from my hotel because the trains weren't running, the buses weren't running. So I needed to get to the event. And during the early part of the morning, the winds weren't that strong. I think they were about maybe 25 to 30 miles an hour. But around 2 p.m., they hit 60 miles per hour and they just increased. Well, I think in some places it it went much higher than that. No, it it did go much higher than that. Just at the beginning, it started off at 60 miles an hour. And that's my point. That's a lot of wind. I know that some of the attendees at my event, they had to go home early because trees had knocked down um, power lines in their backyard. Now, did you experience any power outages in the city? Some parts did. I didn't. I'm thinking they possibly had a backup generator. And at the conference center that we were at, we also weren't hit. But I was in such a large building and you could still hear and feel the weight of the winds. And D.C. was actually on the southern end of this big storm, one of the least impacted by this. And yet you're still having to deal with public transportation being shut down and the federal government. You Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the federal government shut down that day. My brother's girlfriend works for the federal government. She didn't go into work. My brother didn't go into work. Typical federal (laughs) workers not going to work, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) But what's surprising to me is that it's still going on. It's almost, I would say, almost two weeks Oh, yeah. Well, we're going to get to that. This is still going on. And so there was a second nor'easter that occurred on Wednesday, March 7th. So this is five days later. 40,000 people across New England were still without power when this second storm slammed into New England. Heavy snow was dumped in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, and all over southern New England, bringing down even more power lines in the midst of power companies scrambling to fix problems from the first storm. More than 500 flights were canceled. Amtrak had to shut down trains again. And this time, over half a million people had no power. But Mariah, this story keeps on going. Today, a week after that second storm, today about 170,000 people are without power in Massachusetts after a third nor'easter slammed into the state with 80 mile per hour winds on Tuesday, March 13th. And we're recording this on the 14th, so there will likely be more updates by the time you listen to this. But these storms are expected to persist for another two weeks or maybe more. Wow. Every one of these storms has set a record in some way. This storm brought a ton of snow and broke the record from a 1993 blizzard. Do you have any updates about what they're trying to do to fix the problem? I know earlier you mentioned that, you know, the winds were too strong for the trucks to even be sent out. Well, I mean, they're just doing the same. The same thing. I mean, they're just trying to fix power lines, right? I mean, that's all you can do is, is just try to rebuild and recover from these storms, but you can't stop them. You know, this is one of the possible consequences of climate change. David has gone over this in detail, but as you add energy to these climate systems, storms like this happen more frequently and they come with a much bigger impact. What would you suggest that Americans do to better prepare for this kind of situation? We talked about, you know, water outages and shortages. 
But what about something like this? Like, how do you prepare for that? Well, let me ask you. I mean, when you were living in China, not just the water, but the power would go out too, right? What would your community do to help prepare for some of these things? Well, first of all, I think that's that's a great question. Well, I think the way my community was, I guess, organized is that if the power was out, it was okay. They would go outside. They would walk. They would really, they would just carry on about. Well, what about day. food storage? Does anybody store food? But see, again, I think it just goes back to their culture. They naturally don't keep as much food. Okay. And I'm generalizing here in their fridge. So they usually, they go to the markets, the local markets every morning to buy what they need for the day. So, you know, it's not like a lot of their food would spoil or anything. Although if you do rely on getting your food each day, if your food transportation system relies on electricity and these power grids go down, you may have trouble getting this food in the first place. I mean, especially if you're in the United States and you live in a suburb and you got to go to the grocery store where your food comes from far away. These are the types of systems that could become disrupted. So storing food is definitely something I would recommend for people in the United States. I think that's the biggest difference though. Well, a big difference between America and China is that they have an abundance of local markets that don't rely on big 16 wheel trucks to deliver. Most of them come from smaller local farmers and such. That- well, that's great. And that's actually another point. That's something we talked about last week when we sat down with Chris D'Alessandro is the way we get food in the United States, this huge system for transporting food from far distances and the reliance on industrial agriculture that itself is not sustainable. And maybe, you know, we do need to get back towards a system of local farmers, local markets. And I guess what you experienced in China, Mariah, is when the power goes out, it wasn't really a problem because people had a dependable source of locally produced food. Yeah, food. And if you want to go there, activities. So most people in my community would wake up really early and they would go out for their morning exercise every single day. And we had a really large community square where thousands of people would gather and just, you know, take part in what's called Guangchanggu or like dance or whatever activity. So it didn't really disrupt their life as much. Well, I'm glad you bring this up. So this may be a good place to discuss community and some of the effects the rising costs from these events that disrupt power grids and damage infrastructure can have on our communities. So in episode 13, our infrastructure episode, we mentioned the death spiral that cities and municipalities face in an environment of rising costs from infrastructure and investment gaps and things like our pension systems, which we'll get to in just a little bit. And it's a simple concept, really. Many cities and municipalities took on debt to expand their infrastructure, roads, water pipes, light rail, power lines, and grid infrastructure, all in the expectation that the added infrastructure would stimulate growth, bring in new citizens, and then these new citizens would pay for the cost of maintaining and upgrading these systems through tax revenue collected. But for a lot of places, it didn't really work out that way. As populations grew, new infrastructure had to be built to support these new people, And this growth expanded outwards in periods of sprawl so that the ratio of infrastructure per resident increased dramatically. Things like water pipes per person, for example. And this means that ultimately, the cost of this infrastructure outpaces revenue coming in. And maintenance gets ignored as the can just gets kicked further down the road until these aging systems can't withstand the stress anymore and they start breaking. Now, the water infrastructure in Los Angeles is one example of this that we highlighted in that episode. 76% of all the water pipes in Los Angeles are between 75 and 100 years old. And these are pipes that were built to last no more than 100 years. Currently, the city is replacing their pipes at a rate of once every 300 years, although they are hoping to get to a 250-year replacement cycle. So as these systems start failing in ways that impact the day-to-day lives of residents, you know, water leaks, busted pipes that flood streets like in Atlanta, or any other infrastructure failure that becomes more frequent, like power outages, as these things happen, a death spiral sets in. Residents that can't afford to do so will simply leave. And this erodes the tax base, leaving the municipality with less money to address these problems. They get worse and more people leave. Now, the city has trouble paying and maintaining quality civil servants, and city services suffer. More people leave and it becomes impossible to recover. And and so I wonder, could we help mitigate the risks of these death spirals if we built communities in a more integrated way, in a way that, that emphasized the value of social relationships so that instead of moving away from problems, people felt invested in their community and were incentivized to solve things together? 
This is something that we did touch on briefly at the end of last week's agriculture episode. So, you know, maybe we don't need to go into it in too much detail, but it is something to think about and something I think you bring up, Mariah, with your example of how community is structured a little bit differently in China. Yeah, I would agree with your point about building communities to help people feel more invested in solving problems. Let's move on and look at another broken system that represents more demand for public funds, adding to the risk of these death spirals. And this, of course, comes from episode 10, where we talk about the public and private pension systems, not just in the U.S., but globally. So a recent survey came out this year suggesting that 42% of Americans have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. That puts many at risk of retiring broke, since those over 65 years old spend, on average, $46,000 per year. And to recap from our episode, Broken Promises, there is a pension crisis in the United States and around the world that faces an inevitable meltdown, which puts countless people at risk, both directly from retirement benefits promised that cannot be fulfilled and indirectly from stock market losses and financial crises that result. In the United States alone, there are $6 trillion in unfunded public pension benefits. That's 40% of our GDP, and it's how much we would need right now so that the principal and interest and tax revenue going forward will be able to match pension payments in the future. This does not even include Social Security, which is a whole different but kind of related animal. And by 2050, the global savings gap, the figure needed to prevent people from retiring broke, that figure will be $400 trillion. Wow. That's trillion with a T. And it represents about four to five times the total global GDP or gross world product. Now, obviously, we will never come up with that money. And in the episode, we discuss in depth a little bit how we got into this unfunded mess in the first place and some of the perverse incentives keeping everyone's eyes closed to the reality that these pension systems are going to go bust and drag many municipalities down with them. In the same way that these cities took on huge liabilities to expand their infrastructure and in the hopes that it would attract more residents and revenue, they did the same thing with pension promises, taking on huge liabilities in the form of future payouts with the hopes that the amazing benefits would attract good civil servants, which would then bring in more residents and more revenue. And to quickly summarize, so a pension fund has two ways of making money. It receives tax revenue usually as some percentage of workers' salary, and it tries to grow its fund through investment. Well, when the managers of this pension fund decide how much workers should contribute, they take into account what they expect to make in the financial market. And the more they expect to make from investment, the less they have to take from workers. So from a political standpoint, there is an incentive to minimize the amount workers contribute because that's what makes it attractive to work for this city. And on the flip side, they want to exaggerate the returns the market can generate. Now, many public pension funds have done this, but the market hasn't been returning what these funds expected. And now they don't have enough money to keep their promises. And it's a big problem. So California has the biggest unfunded liability in the United States at $1 trillion. And they won't admit this. They say their liability is only around $150 billion. But this is a phenomenon that occurs in many of the broken systems we talk about. Whether it's climate change, the economy, agriculture, whatever it is, the people who are at the vanguard of these unsustainable systems continue to say that nothing is wrong. They ignore the naysayers. You know, they say, don't listen to that show, Ashes, Ashes. And sometimes it can create a pretty comical situation. All right, you ready for this one, Mariah? Oh, yeah. So on February 12th of this year, the Sacramento Bee, which is a California newspaper, reported the following. Quote, pension fund hits milestone. It's earning more money than it's paying out. It's, of course, talking about CalPERS, which is the largest public pension system in the United States. And the chief investment officer of CalPERS said that they are now stable. They are making more money than ever because of the gains they've made from the stock market and because of worker contributions. And they project that they will continue to make positive cash flow for the next few decades because of these great stock market returns. Okay. Eight days later, on February 20th, the Wall Street Journal reports, and this might have been on the front page, I don't really remember, they report that over a 10-day period in February, CalPERS lost $18.5 billion, representing 5% of all the assets that they own. So that same investment officer that the Sacramento Bee quoted said, well, it looks like it's going to be a pretty volatile year or you know, something like that. Well, the market did return about half that value back to the fund over the next couple of weeks. 
And this is a great example of two things. So one is the inability of these funds in their localities to tell the truth about their dire situation. And two, the perverse incentives that these funds have to invest more and more into risky assets that that make them vulnerable to these market swings and guarantee that they will go bust even harder when the next market recession comes. And private equity groups like Blackstone, that same group we discussed as being almost predatory in the way they take advantage of pension funds, well, Blackstone announced in February that they plan to double the total assets they manage. And that's being driven in large part by these pension funds and their desire to take on risk to satisfy their impossible goals. That sounds like trouble. Well, it is trouble, Mariah, because the more these pensions take on risk, the more they get in trouble and the more they have to pull funding away from other city services, away from other public funds. And it all adds to the storm leading these cities and municipalities into that death spiral. Yeah, when you talked about Blackstone taking on more risk, doubling their risk, it kind of reminds me of the financial crash a couple years ago. Well, yeah, and that's a great point because the 2008 financial crisis, it kind of put so many of these public pension funds in dire situations, right? Because a lot of them had a big portion of their assets allocated into stocks, you know, the financial crash occurred. And a lot of these pension funds lost a ton of value. And with that, their ability to pay these benefits in the future. And what's so ironic about that is that it's only increased the need or the desire among these fund managers to put even more assets into risky classes. So right now, the average percentage of pension fund assets in these risky equities is higher, even higher than it was prior to the 2008 financial crisis. So it's absolutely true that this is really a foreshadowing, I think, of another big market crash that's going to really hurt these pension funds in ways that they've never been hurt before. And I don't think that they're going to be able to recover because they haven't recovered even from the 2008 financial crisis. And this next one is going to be even worse. This is where community is really important. I hate to continue to talk about this and make the comparison, but in China, in their culture, to respect your elders, it means to take care of them in their old age. They spent 20, 30 years taking care of you and supporting you, and in turn, you're expected to do the same thing. They do have something like a pension fund from the government, depending on if they are a government worker or not, then they are in some ways taken care of by the government, but in the most ways, their children um, take care of them. The first time I lived in China, I worked with what was called the abandoned elderly. They either didn't have children to support them or their children, you know, moved overseas and were unable to support them. And they came together as a community and would do things together to have a lifestyle. And I think when these pension funds do crash, we're going to need more Americans to sacrifice and be willing to help out. If we as society said, hey, it's not okay for people to die in poverty, then we as a community can come together and help take care of people. And it doesn't have to just be, oh, well, those are your parents. You pay for them. It's not coming out of my pocket. Whether I pay taxes or whether I directly pay, I'm not doing it. That's not community, you know? I mean, that's just everyone out to take care of themselves. I know you guys talk a lot about community. What does community mean to you all? Like when you guys continue to use the term community, how do you define that? In Peace Corps, they use that a lot. Find your community, find your community. Well, what does that look like in a city of 14 million people in a province of a couple million people? On your pension thing, you said the risk of these death spirals if we built communities in a more integrated way. Well, what does that mean? I would say two things. One, with that whole integrated thing, I mean, literally building cities that are integrated, meaning I don't put a neighborhood here and a factory here and the offices here. We integrate them so that people have to work together in order to make them work. You put a factory next to a neighborhood, that neighborhood doesn't want pollution. So they're going to fight to keep pollution down from the factory. That requires them to interact with the factory. You put the factory 100 miles away, they don't ever have to see it. The factory can pollute, no problem. So that's what I mean by integrated. But number two, to your point about, oh, I have a large city, what is 14? Uh, Well, you know, maybe that's part of the problem is that we've scaled things too big and we need more smaller integrations. We need farms close to where people eat. So you're defining community by size and by location and by I the way I define it is the relationship that people have to each other meaning I do something it affects someone else I want you to see the effect that you have on someone else the way that I live my life the foods that I buy the energy that I burn is harming someone else but because I don't see it I don't give a shit. 
So my point about bringing communities closer is if I do something wrong, if I do something that causes a bad externality, I want to see that. I want to see the people it affects. And part of that means we don't just outsource everything. We don't just move everything away from what we do. So community is I relate to you. My actions impact you. Your actions impact me. Therefore, we're more incentivized to help each other. When you're in charge of a pension fund and you got a billion dollars under assets and you make some decision that gives you a million dollars in your bank account and it somehow affects other people, but you don't really care, you've hurt people. You cause maybe thousands of people to go broke, but you don't care because you don't see it. It doesn't mean anything to you. So we don't need systems. I mean, this is the central realization is that centralization and power is harmful. You allow power to accumulate into a small point. You leverage harm and you increase the cascading effect that, that someone can make a decision that's so far removed from their lives that they don't care. And it affects millions of people and ruins their lives. That should not be allowed. Yeah. That's what we need to not support is systems that allow power to consolidate in these very small, concentrated ways that start wreaking havoc on our lives because a very small people have some very perverse incentives that benefit them but harm millions more. Well, Mariah, you bring up a good point. So let me ask you, are your parents retired at this point? My dad's retired and my mom is on the way. What did your dad do before he retired? My dad was a math teacher for 30 years in different metro Atlanta counties. And my mom did social work for 10 years and then she became an elementary school teacher. And she's been doing that for the past 15 to 20 years. Okay. So, and do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have three siblings. I have an older brother, an older sister, and a younger brother. And if something happened to the financial security of your parents, let's say they can no longer support themselves in their old age. Do you think that you and your siblings would try to pitch in to kind of help them survive? I know we would pitch in to help them survive. There's no way I would tell my parents, oh, well, you don't have any money. You're out of luck, you know, and continue to live my life. No, we definitely would all pitch in and consider the best options well, I don't think you're alone in that. I think a lot of people would do the same thing. And that's really something that I want to stress in the context of these pension systems is that in the same way that these cities and municipalities are on the precipice of a death spiral, like we talked about because of rising infrastructure costs, the threat of a shrinking tax base, increased unfunded liabilities in their pension systems. Well, because of all these things competing for public funds, cities no longer have good choices and bad choices, right? They just have equally bad trade-offs. The choice becomes, do we pay our pension benefits and neglect needed infrastructure repairs and experience rapid decline? Or do we pay for infrastructure but renege on pension promises and go bankrupt? Well, in the same way, individuals and families are in very similar situations. Wages are stagnant, but costs are rising. Student debt, healthcare bills, cost of living, and now social costs like the burden of your parents' retirement. Under the weight of all these things, People are finding it difficult to stay afloat and the choices become trade-offs. Do I put a couple hundred bucks away for my own retirement each month and let my parents suffer? Or do I help them but neglect my own future? But the narratives surrounding these issues don't seem to address the systemic aspect of these problems. So even that study that I referenced at the beginning of this section, that 42% of Americans are at risk of retiring broke, well, this study describes the solution as, hey, people should save more for retirement, you know, which puts the blame and responsibility solely on the shoulders of individuals and families. Now, look, don't get me wrong. If you have the ability to save money and be financially responsible, you absolutely should because it will make your own life easier and those that depend on you and care for you. But looking at this as a larger system, this is not a failing of individuals. When half the entire country is facing poverty in their old age, we can't just say people should save more. We have to recognize that there are deep flaws in the way we have organized our economy. And it is that economy that is failing people. But that's enough about pensions, enough about infrastructure and municipalities and the economy. Let's move on to a completely different topic, and that is government surveillance. This is something that we cover in episode nine, Nothing Left to Hide, in which we deal with the proliferation of techniques by governments to surveil their citizens and the industry that has sprung up to support those governments, to sell them products and to make a profit off the desire of governments to control their own populations. And so a huge component of this issue surrounding government surveillance is that industry that is churning out these technologies and selling them to governments, which again, these governments turn around and they use these technologies to repress dissidents in their own country, to spy on law-abiding citizens, 
and to compile illegal data on people. And we discussed in that episode how Turkey has been detaining hundreds of thousands of people for simply downloading a phone app. Many of the people who were detained hadn't even downloaded the app, but were detained anyway on suspicion that they did. And many other human rights abuses have been and are being carried out in Turkey, including about 50,000 people held in detention without trial. And many journalists, human rights activists, and feminists have been locked up in prison on false charges. Well, it was recently revealed that the UK authorized a company called Surveillance Group to export about $3.2 million worth of surveillance technology to Turkey last year. And this company specializes in things like social media data collection and facial recognition. And what's really revealing about this story is not just that the company surveillance group is selling spy technology to a repressive government, but that it is doing so in the face of enormous evidence that the Turkish government is repressing its own people. And this is not speculation at this point, but it's something that both the UN and the UK government itself have publicly stated. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said the Turkish government, quote, seems to have criminalized the legitimate exercise of the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and association and freedom of opinion and expression using emergency decrees that fail to meet international human rights standards. And a committee of the UK Parliament said, quote, There is a fundamental intolerance of alternative narratives in Turkey, with the government broadly suppressing, discrediting, or punishing those who contradict its authorized accounts of sensitive events. So Mariah, quick question. So this surveillance group is a private company. Do you think there should be rules, maybe international rules in place to prevent private companies from selling military and spy equipment to governments that are going to use that equipment against their own people? Should private companies have free reign to just sell harmful technology to anybody in the world that's willing to pay for it? There definitely needs to be international laws regulating that because I think the differences between a private company and a government is that they have different incentives with private companies primarily looking for markets and, you know, who will pay the money and buy their equipment and governments having a whole different set of priorities. So, yeah. Well, you're not alone in that opinion. The European Union itself has rules specifically in place for that. And yes, the United Kingdom is still part of the EU, at least for another year. And as per the legal language of EU rules that oversee the exportation of military technology, quote, member states shall deny an export license if there is a clear risk that the military technology or equipment to be exported might be used for internal repression. And so the UK obviously had to give the go-ahead for surveillance group to export this technology to Turkey. And so this is a clear failing of both the UK government, but this is also a failing of the company itself. Is it a failing or just, I think it's more a total disregard for the law. I mean, failing implies that you tried and you just, you just couldn't uphold the standards. <laughs> they yeah. intentionally, you know, decided to disregard the law. Yeah, well, and in episode nine, we said, look, these companies say they are just trying to help and don't allow their products to be used for oppressive means, but that's just what they say, and it's not true. And, you know, maybe someone out there could have argued with us in defense of these companies, saying, well, how are these companies to know? They're halfway around the world in Israel, New Zealand, the UK, or the US. How are they supposed to know their technology will be used by the Mexican government to oppress nutrition activists? Or how are they supposed to know that their tech will be used to persecute political dissidents in Turkey? Whoever asked that question does not know how these companies operate. They have analysts. They have country specialists who are well aware of the situations in these countries. Well, not to mention they have to deal directly with the governments. So they probably oftentimes tailor these products to the needs of these governments. Look, there's really no argument here. At least in this story, there's no controversy over Turkish repression. And it's illegal for EU members to sell this tech to repressive governments. But this company does it anyway, knowing that its tech will be used against law-abiding and innocent citizens. The people at this company do not care. They do it because they know they can make some profit and get away with it. But this spying is not limited to companies selling to repressive governments, but within governments that we might consider very democratic and progressive. It was recently discovered that Norway built a surveillance base with the help of the U.S. National Security Agency, one of our favorite organizations in the U.S., and used more than $33 million of taxpayer money and hid its function from the public. Now, this surveillance base that they built in Norway, the government itself was told in classified documents that the purpose of the base is to monitor for terrorism abroad. And the public itself was told 
that its function was simple communication between NATO allies and military troops. And what it actually has been doing, in addition to military intelligence, is intercepting phone call and email records by Norwegian citizens to friends and family overseas in order to analyze social networks and identify new targets for investigation. And the Norwegian intelligence security is now in an ongoing classified dispute with the Norwegian government for spying on its own citizens. I think what's revealing about this is that the surveillance systems that we allow our governments and companies to build in the name of national security ultimately come back home and are used against us. So again, when our governments and our tech companies tell us they want to use the power we give them to only fight the bad guys that want to hurt us, should we believe them? Something to think about. And not just something to think about, but something that we see happening right here in the United States. There is an ongoing lawsuit filed by the Georgetown Center of Privacy and Technology against the NYPD regarding the New York Police Secret Facial Recognition Program. Researchers have been trying for a couple years now to get the police department to reveal the scope of the facial recognition program they have implemented. The police have admitted to using it extensively in everything from monitoring protesters to routine stops and misdemeanors. And although people have been misidentified by the technology, there was no public knowledge of what happened to these people. There was no knowledge about what the police do with the data they get, how they use it, or what the purpose of it is. Court dates have been set for April and May, and they might reveal more information if the judge agrees to force the NYPD to disclose more information. So stay tuned on that, and let's take a look at another secret police initiative that has recently come to light. And that's in New Orleans. So as early as 2012, the New Orleans police formed a partnership with the Silicon Valley company Palantir. Palantir, of course, is a company that was founded by Peter Thiel and with money from the CIA. It builds counterterrorism and intelligence products and also markets itself to the private and financial sectors. And the company formed this partnership with New Orleans police to test and build predictive policing technology. Now, um, predictive policing is hugely controversial, as it should be. And in episode 9, we outline some of the reasons we should be skeptical of it. Some of the reasons include that it leads to more arrests in already overpoliced areas, which simply exacerbate human biases and discrimination. It's also much better at predicting crimes of poverty than anything else, which directs police attention at punishing people simply for being poor. Predictive policing shifts accountability away from police and onto algorithms that are ultimately exhibiting the same human biases as the police. And in New Orleans, this highly intrusive program, costing millions of dollars a year, was kept totally secret by the mayor and by Palantir by classifying it as a philanthropic initiative that did not need to be disclosed. I mean, you have city council members in charge of overseeing public data that just had no idea that this was going on, no idea that data was being given to this company and the risks that were involved with it. And now Palantir, as a company, stresses their commitment to privacy. But let's look at what they've been given access to in New Orleans. This is a private company, right? Mm -hmm. This is insane. Yeah. So the mayor allowed Palantir to access broad law enforcement databases that included court filings, licenses, addresses, phone numbers, social media data, parole information, jailhouse phone calls, and even the central case management system, which has information on every single documented police interaction with citizens, even if there was no arrest. Well, what would they do with that data? So they take all this data and they try to build these social networks so that you can provide a name and get a risk score for that person. So, Mariah, they would take your name and they would type it into a computer and based on all the data about you, but not just you, your family, your friends too, they would say, oh, Mariah is likely to commit a crime. Let's go monitor her. And what's insidious about this process is that Maybe this conclusion is based on a cousin you have that's in jail. So you have nothing to do with this person, but because you're related to them and they committed a crime, this algorithm, this predictive policing is going to predict that you yourself are more likely to commit a crime. So now you have a higher risk score simply for knowing this person. Since you have a higher risk score, maybe the risk scores of your friends go up because they are associated with you. I mean, this is just a ridiculous technology. It's, it's a ridiculous idea. Black populations are already over-policed in this country. And this artificial intelligence looks at arrest data and says, oh, look, all this crime occurs in these areas. Police should go there. 
And then it says, oh, look, all these black people have criminal neighbors. They must be criminals too. Let's monitor them. And it's easy to see how this just creates a feedback loop where over-policed areas get more policed and communities continue to be segregated and the poverty cycle continues, all under the guise of philanthropy. And another aspect of this is something called parallel construction, where evidence is acquired illegally, and then police build cases around people using that evidence, but making it look as if they acquired it honestly. Well, for the past six years in New Orleans, authorities sentenced people in court using Palantir's products without ever disclosing that relationship, something that would normally be required. Um, and Mariah, we did discuss parallel construction in our government surveillance episode, but we may be facing a future where parallel construction, you know, this need for local authorities to acquire evidence in secret, is not even necessary to the same extent it is right now. So Mariah, I want to ask you a question. If I'm a police officer and I acquire evidence on you using an illegal method without a warrant, you know, let's say I stick a GPS tracker on your car without your knowledge. The way I get this information on you is in clear violation of the Constitution. Well, when we go to court, do you think I can use that evidence against you? No. You might think that, but you'd be wrong. A man was sentenced to 10 years in prison in Arizona a while back for hauling marijuana with a tractor. He and his attorney appealed, saying the way that police acquired evidence against him by placing a GPS tracker on his tractor without a warrant was not legal. And this appeal went to the Arizona High Court, and the court agreed. They said, you're right. Police violated the man's rights when they acquired this evidence illegally. So he went free? Mariah, they um, let him go? <laughs> you're wrong again, Mariah. That's two strikes. Man. <laughs> the Arizona High Court ruled that although the evidence was illegally acquired, it was still permissible in court because the officers were trying their best to follow the law at the time. I'm so confused. So what's the point of the Constitution if you just try to follow the law and you just fall short? You know, this sounds silly, but the Supreme Court agrees with this rationale. So according to the Supreme Court, our highest court in the United States, prosecutors and the government are allowed to use evidence that was illegally acquired so long as investigators were trying to follow the law. Okay, so how are they justifying this? Because this seems like a stretch. According to the Supreme Court, the whole intent behind the rule in the first place, this rule that illegally obtained evidence cannot be used in court, this rule has nothing to do with protecting rights, according to the Supreme Court. The intent behind this rule is solely to prevent authorities from misconduct. Therefore, if police are trying to follow the law, it's not an instance of misconduct and thus should be allowed. Right to the people be damned. You know what? This reminds me of a constitutional law class I had in college where they discussed how Supreme Court justices ruled on cases. And a big one is the spirit of the law. And that's what this reminds me of. Well, if the spirit of the law, even if it says this, if the spirit was this, then it's OK. And so I think yeah. that goes back to a larger issue. Yeah, well, I wonder if the spirit of the law logic would work next time I get pulled over. I mean, well, OK, so I'm white, um, you're black. So I guess I should say next time you get pulled over, am I right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mariah, you get pulled over. You think the police would let you go if you said, oh, sorry, officer, I was trying to follow the law. I just didn't see that red light. There's no telling what ticket I get. OK, well, so far, these have all been updates regarding surveillance and police in the West, with the exception of Turkey, and some people might still not be convinced that predictive policing and these surveillance technologies and our own local authorities are topics to really be concerned about. So this might be a good time to take a look at some updates in China's surveillance program and what some of this stuff looks like when it's ramped up a few notches. Mariah, I'm sure you're well aware of this. This is also a time of unprecedented spending and centralization by the Chinese government on matters of domestic surveillance. Currently, spending on domestic security exceeds the national defense budget by 20%, and it accounts for 6% of all government spending. That's huge. And, and this is a big part of the world that is undergoing rapid change in this area. So as we discussed in episode 9, province of Xinjiang may be one of the most heavily surveilled places on Earth, and some new tech has arrived on scene to augment this fact. China already has about 150 million surveillance cameras in place. And for comparison, the United Kingdom has about 6 million. And China has set a target recently for 600 million cameras, all equipped with AI and facial recognition software. 
But now, police officers are being equipped with facial recognition glasses that allow them to scan faces in real time and receive alerts related to individuals that are flagged by the database. And it goes without saying that these predictive policing systems that we talked about are, of course, being integrated with this technology. Marat, the province that you stayed at in China, Mm -hmm. how close were you to Xinjiang? It was right next to it. So a train from my capital city where I lived in Lanzhou to the capital of Xinjiang, Urumqi, would probably take about 12 hours. And within China, that's not that long. Do you feel like the area you lived in was surveilled in any way? Oh, yeah, definitely. The whole of China is surveilled. But because my province was next to Xinjiang and also it was beside Tibet, there was a lot of surveillance. So do you think, at least in Xinjiang, a lot of this technology is aimed at, I guess, controlling the minority Uyghur population, right? Do you think that this is just China trying to protect its citizens from dangerous people or is maybe something else going on? When you look at the larger picture of China and its behavior in the region, you'll see that it's trying to reestablish itself as a leader in Asia, not just East Asia, but also Central Asia and Southeast Asia. Historically, Russia has had more influence in the region, but now the shifting towards China and maintaining control of Xinjiang is very important for geopolitical reasons. I'm not sure if any of you listeners know about the One Belt, One Road initiative, but Xinjiang is important for that. Let me ask you this. Obviously, the authorities in China are coming down very hard on the Uyghur population. In your experience, though, how do just everyday Chinese citizens view this population? And is their view in some way influenced by the narrative by the state itself? That's a great question. So first of all, because of its location in the very, very far northwest, most Chinese people don't travel to the region. It's not one on their travel hotspot for when they are allowed to take vacations. But secondly, there is a lot of propaganda within the um, Chinese state sponsored media about the people, about their culture and about what they believe and how they act, especially since they are a minority that is more religiously oriented. So a lot of people, I would say outside and I'm generalizing here. A lot of people outside of the province believe Uyghurs to be uneducated, poor, and uh, religious extremists. And that is due to a, a lack of knowledge, a lack of interaction with Uyghurs or people from the region, but more importantly, from the state-sponsored media. To justify the surveillance and the violence and the control that the government is carrying out in the region. Well, I I think that's such a great point. And really, what is the danger with all this stuff? We have to realize that these governments and the companies that build their surveillance and control infrastructure use emotionally charged messages to make people afraid of terrorists, to make them afraid of their neighbors and of enemies overseas. You know, whatever it takes to get these initiatives approved so that people will tolerate human rights abuses in the name of security and so that they will turn a blind eye towards injustice against others. One thing I always found interesting about the state-sponsored propaganda as it relates to Uyghurs is that the Chinese government loves to advocate for one China or we're all Chinese, we're all one China. And yet it also, through their propaganda, distinguishes Uyghurs as Uyghurs and as this extremist minority. And then we're Han and we are, we are peaceful and they are the other But yet at the same time, they justify what they're doing there because one China to advocate for one China. So that I've always found it ironic. It just doesn't add up to me. Well, it's interesting you mentioned one China because right now in Xinjiang, authorities are using this, you know, artificial intelligence and predictive policing not to prevent violent crime or anything like that, but to systematically round up and imprison hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs into political education camps. So I guess instead of this idea that, hey, we're all Chinese, instead of embracing our differences, let's just make everybody the same. So these people are held for months in camps designed to brainwash and convert them to Chinese political doctrine. They're forced to sing patriotic songs, swear fealty to the Chinese state, learn Mandarin if they don't know it already, and so much more. And the reason for these incarcerations are not crimes, like I said, but they're cultural. Oh, you are praying too much? You're sent to camp. You visited a website that we disagree with, you're sent to camp. Oh, you bought a lot of fertilizer, you're hoarding food in your apartment, you must be a terrorist, you're sent to camp. Your child didn't go to school, you must be planning a terrorist attack. 
you're sent to camp. Th- this is a human rights catastrophe, and the police are openly bragging about this. A police officer went on record to talk about the use of big data in Xinjiang and says, quote, Before the application of big data, police often only arrested people after they had committed wrongdoing. Now they can take preventive measures in advance. That's obviously bad. A huge, like I said, human rights catastrophe. But okay, let's shift gears only slightly to cover the private sector and discuss updates to episode three, Permanent Record. In that episode, we discuss surveillance and tracking by private companies in the real world. The data that is harvested on us, sold to data brokers, and then used against us to take advantage of vulnerabilities and manipulate us into certain behavior. Well, there is an unintended consequence of this increased surveillance everywhere, and that is that the number of doors it opens for hackers and others with malicious intent to take advantage of goes up. In the UK, a group has picked up on security flaws in the superfluous surveillance cameras that are everywhere and is actively streaming live footage of UK schools on its website. So people who go to this website, and no, we're not going to provide the URL. So that means I can't see it? (laughs) No, Mariah, I'm afraid you can't spy on little kids in schools. Oh, that sounds so wrong. Well, this is what's happening. People can watch live feeds of school restrooms, playgrounds, classroom. I don't know why. Does the UK have cameras in their school restrooms? We don't have that in the United States. Not that we know of. Ooh, good point. Well, this website brags about having a large database of available cameras to choose from, and it is not limited to the UK, but other countries as well, including the United States. And other websites are doing similar things with private networks to display interiors of homes, churches, changing rooms, and all kinds of creepy stuff. And there is an ongoing investigation into this website because it is clearly illegal, But it's so easy to obscure server locations and the people behind online activity that this type of thing is no doubt going to become more and more common the more we allow these intrusive surveillance technologies to invade every part of our lives. But this is not just a concern with cameras, but really any product in our world that has connectivity. And more and more companies are integrating their products with connectivity as it enables easier data collection, which they can then sell for profit to those data brokers we mentioned. A research group recently discovered massive security flaws in a range of Wi-Fi-enabled baby monitors sold by a company out of Hong Kong. Over 50,000 user accounts were compromised to hackers. These researchers notified the company, but no patch has been put out to fix the flaws. And it was a simple flaw to exploit. Researchers were able to gain direct access to the two-way audio functions, discover account information of people that owned this product, and more. I think the researchers should make this public so that the parents can be aware and just stop buying the baby monitors. Well, no, they did. And this is an ongoing research into these products made by this specific company. But see, this is the problem is that so many of our products have this connectivity that a lot of security is compromised that we're not even aware of. But I mean, what parent out there is going online to read obscure tech blogs related to coding and various you know, products that they may or may not have? Probably not that many, right? And I mean, we did see in episode three how children's toys like dolls that were connected to the internet could be easily hacked to gain access to voice and audio capabilities and potentially interact directly with children. In one case, thousands of voice recordings of children using their toys were leaked from a company database. And many of these toys are produced by not toy companies, but intelligence companies that gather data about children and then sell that data to advertisers and other data brokers. Talk about starting early, you know, getting that information on. (laughs) Yeah, this is such a big problem now. It does make me really question, like, what is this doing, you know, to our future generations that are born into this data collecting world that, that everything about them is known from day one? I mean, that's they literally have no choice, no say in, in the matter. And that's exactly something I think we should bring up is when it comes to this data collection, there really is no easy opting out. This is something we talked about with Facebook. Oh, if you don't like it, just don't use it. But when this is the entire world and everything we do is being monitored, how do you just opt out of that? I was just going to say, how do you opt out when you don't even know you're opted in? Exactly. And, you know, these Wi-Fi enabled baby monitors, they're just another object under this umbrella of Internet of Things that we are discovering more and more. It's just a terrible thing to own because of how easy they are to hack and because of the data that they acquire about you and your families that can be sold and abused to take advantage of you. And look, I just want to throw this out there. You know, I don't want to make a big discussion about this, but we already stress in the show the need to question everything and to question things at the source, the underlying systems. 
And this may be a case where underlying societal flaws have produced a negative symptom that we are trying to bandage as opposed to addressing the real problem. As I was reading about this security flaw in baby monitors, I noticed the proposed solution are all, you know, the familiar ones. Things like, we need to patch security in these types of devices, and consumers need awareness and education and all that stuff. But it made me wonder, why do we have baby monitors in the first place? I mean, individualism is my favorite thing to criticize, and it makes me wonder if this is just another symptom of a society that breaks people apart into little atomized compartments, puts stress on them so that they have to constantly compete for jobs and wages, overloading their schedules, and making it hard to focus on developing relationships and communities. Is it a positive thing that in our society, parents are so busy they have to leave their newborns in separate rooms? Is it normal to make a baby sleep alone? Is that consistent with our biology and the way we evolved in the context of tightly knit groups? I think if you think about it just from a cultural perspective, think about a new mother with her first child. And a big part of our culture is creating the baby room and, oh, what colors are you going to put in your nursery? Mm. And I don't think that people even realize subconsciously that it's not normal for your newborn baby or even your five-month-old, six-month-old to sleep in a separate room. In some communities around the world, most new babies stay attached to their mother and sleep with their parents, you know, up until they're two. I agree with you. Why do we need baby monitors? Why do we put our newborn babies into a separate room? You know what you just reminded me of is our episode on propaganda. You know, what did you just say? Uh, About the nurseries and the baby room. This is just something cultural that's become normalized that we don't even think about. And that's exactly the type of thing that Edward Bernays and all these propagandists seek to do in shaping our behavior is, hey, how can we make certain habits normal in society so that people don't even think about it, so that they don't even question the need to purchase a baby crib. They don't even think about the need to purchase a baby monitor. It's just what they do. And that's how we can make more money. And this may just be another example of that. But look, this is just something to think about. I'm not a parent, so moving on. More cars were added to cellular networks in 2017 than new phones were. And this year, 98% of new cars will have internet connectivity. And this is, of course, motivated by the increased revenue that can be made by selling consumer data. You know, everything from fuel consumption, tire pressure, driving habits, and so much more. But for those of you who have followed us on our surveillance and tracking series, but who are still saying, what's the big deal about giving up our data to companies who can use that data to improve our experience? Is it really about improving the experience? Or is it, as we've said, just a clever ploy to get more money out of us and control our behavior? Let's see what the airline industry has to say. Airlines are preparing for the integration of dynamic pricing in the way they charge customers. Now, what does this mean? The idea is to use big data to personally identify each individual that comes to an airline site and then adjust prices based on that individual, how much money they make. Are they traveling for personal or business reasons? Do they travel often? All these types of things. The more data they have on you, the more they can figure out the most you're willing to pay for a ticket and then charge you accordingly. And where does this data come from? Well, of course, it comes from everywhere. The websites we visit, the products we buy, the events we go to, the companies we work for. Big data has become so valuable to advertisers that just about every company that can acquire data on us will. And then turn around and sell that data to brokers who compile it, categorize it, and sell it in packages to others who want to use that information to take advantage of us. Just like these airline companies. And before you say, oh, they just want this data to improve their services for the consumer's benefit. This dynamic pricing comes at the same time the airline industry has been lobbying the Department of Transportation to remove regulations put in place to protect consumers. Some of the rules that airlines have asked the DOT to remove include showing the full price of tickets before a customer purchases it, removing the tarmac delay rule, which fines airlines that strand passengers on planes for long periods. They want to remove the 24-hour guaranteed refund, so if you wanted to make a change to your ticket five minutes after you purchased it, you could be subject to a change fee. But at the same time, they also want to remove a rule that requires airlines to honor prices for tickets they sold by mistake. Now, Mariah, as we discussed in episode three in greater detail, ultimately the logical conclusion of all this tracking and data collection is to make more money. Why do companies want to buy the data off your iRobot vacuum cleaner and figure out the layout of your house? Why do they purchase data on the drugs you take and the physical or mental diseases you might be suffering from? 
Why do they want to know how you drive your car? How often you fuel up at the gas station? How fast you drive? Where you're going and when you go there? Because once they know everything about you, they can extract the most money possible from you. Oh, you're trying to buy a ticket from Atlanta to Seattle, but you're a businesswoman with deep pockets? We can charge you more. Oh, you're trying to buy a ticket from New York to Miami to visit your mother in the hospital? Well, we know you're going no matter what and that you don't own a car, so you don't have any alternative transportation options. So we're going to charge you more than we would someone else. Once everything is known about you, there is no limit to the creativity that can be conjured up to take advantage of you at every opportunity. And like you mentioned, Mariah, it becomes impossible to opt out of things like this. When 98% of all cars are connected to the internet, it becomes impossible to prevent insurance companies from getting data on how you drive. And now how you drive affects the money that you have to pay for your insurance. And if you try to opt out of this, now it becomes the same way as if you're trying to opt out of a credit card. Fine. You don't want to build credit. That's okay. But now we're not going to give you a loan. Oh, you want to opt out of this information data collection on your driving? That's fine. But now we're not going to give you car insurance. You didn't even discuss how the state government requires you to have car insurance. You can't really opt out if you have a car and you need to drive because the infrastructure doesn't allow for you to take the train or the bus. So you need a car. That's a good point. Ultimately, a lot of this data collection can just be integrated into the law. And then, uh, yeah, we really don't have any way to opt out of it. So we covered a few of these episodes that we did in depth just now, and we're going to hit just three more episodes, but we're going to do it quick so that we can give you as many updates as possible. Let's start with episode two, Concrete Reef, in which we cover the latest in sea level rise and the impact that this could have on coastal cities, climate refugees, and markets around the world as real estate values collapse in areas that traditionally have the highest values in the world. Now, recently, Tim Grafton of the New Zealand Insurance Council came out with a startling statement. Quote, let me be very clear. Sea level rise is known. It is expected. It is not accidental. And so it will not be insured. At the same time that we have politicians and business leaders saying climate change is not a big deal, and there is an attempt to ignore the realities so that we can maintain the insane premises our economy is built on, those in industries that stand to lose from climate changes, like the insurance industry, are paying attention because their bottom line is at stake. But I think this brings up the point that you made about community and that when things are so far removed from our very own, like where we live, it's harder to believe that it's real. I mean, take the instance of the island in Louisiana, Isle Dijon Charles, and how it's literally, it has disappeared. There's like a couple hundred residents left, but because it's so far removed from, say, Washington, D.C. or a mm. city in California, we don't know that exists. And it's easy to accept the fact that politicians and business leaders are saying that climate change is not a big deal. We haven't really felt the full force of it, but there are communities in America that have. And I think we're going to be feeling it a lot more as these problems start to affect these integrated systems. Yeah, especially when the residents are pushed off their land and now they're moving into your city. And you're like, well, why are they coming here? They literally don't have a place to stay. Now, real estate values change and mm -hmm. markets become more expensive because, as you said, they know that these people have to have a place to stay. Well, not only that, but as these industries wake up to this problem, what happens to these coastal cities when banks won't loan on properties at risk for flooding anymore? What will happen when insurers refuse to insure property? And how will that affect the global financial market with so much money tied up in huge coastal investments? It may not be long before we have the answers to some of these questions, and it's not going to be easy. But let's move on. Episode 15, where we talk about Big Brother Facebook. Well, just recently, the United Nations announced preliminary findings related to an ongoing investigation into human rights abuses in Myanmar. So far, over 700,000 Rohingyas and other ethnic minorities have had to flee the country in the midst of military genocide. The UN reports that Facebook, as a social media platform, has exacerbated this conflict and, quote, turned into a beast, which has enabled incitations of violence and hate against ethnic minorities to proceed unchecked. Now, of course, Facebook claims that it does not tolerate hate speech on its platform. But as we saw in episode 15, the company ultimately heeds the requests of governments it perceives as powerful and ignores the complaints of minorities and other disadvantaged groups when it comes to these issues. Episode 16, last week, we discussed farming and the state of agriculture with Chris D'Alessandro. 
and we touched briefly on the chemical inputs associated with industrial agriculture. Well, because of population growth and an increased demand for meat products worldwide, global fertilizer production has quadrupled in the past 50 years, and we are now expected to reach peak phosphorus, which is an extremely important input to our agricultural systems, within the next 30 years. As phosphorus becomes more scarce, the price will go up, and that means yet another contributor to higher food prices in the future. And Mariah, normally we end Ashes Ashes on a what can we do section to explore possible solutions and things that we can do as individuals to prepare for and respond to all this bad news. But we've covered too many topics, I think, to do some kind of broad what can we do. So instead, I've got a little bit of good news that I think we can end on. Well, that's always nice. Yeah. And the UN estimates that at current topsoil loss, we have just 60 years left of agricultural yields before our entire food system collapses globally. That's, that's not the good news part. Wait for it. I'm waiting. Well, the UK is responding to this crisis. And this year, a new bill will be brought before Parliament that would mandate soil protection and regeneration within the United Kingdom. This would be the very first bill of its kind. And it would be a good first major step towards the direction of reducing and maybe even reversing some of the consequences of industrial agriculture. Of course, it has not yet been approved, so to find out what happens, you'll need to stay tuned for another episode of Ashes Ashes. Mariah, thanks again for joining us. I think you really provided a needed perspective on this show. We've all been getting tired of listening to David (laughs) Torsipia. Just joking, David. Uh, Excited for you to be back next week. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy listening to Ashes Ashes and hearing the different perspectives of you and David. Okay. And I think that Ashes Ashes brings up issues that aren't covered by major media platforms or even some of the smaller ones. Thank you for that, Mariah. And thank you for joining us. And I hope it's not the last time that we have your perspective on this show. If you want to find out more information about these topics, you can visit our website, ashesashes.org where we have a full transcript of this episode and many links, sources, and more information. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible. And we will never use ads to support this show, and we will never purchase ads to flood your news feeds. So if you enjoy this show and would like us to keep going, you can support us by giving us a review and recommending us to a friend. Also, we have an email address. It's contact at ashesashes.org. And we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think, positive or negative. We'll read it. And if you have any stories related to these topics, let us know and maybe we can share them in an upcoming episode or on our website. You can find out more information, not just on our website, but also on your favorite social media network. We're on all of them at Ashes Ashes Cast. We've got a super exciting episode next week that we really hope you tune into. Uh, David will be back in town and joining us for another deep dive into a very interesting and very broken system. Until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye.